Oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. What time is it? It's 5.30 in Greece, Vasiliki. And that, you guessed it, questions and answers. Why do we call it questions and answers? Well, you send questions and I give you answers. I usually speak in a British accent and loud and slow, and that makes you believe what I say. But since I'm Joe Bennett and I'm in the top 75% of all catamaran sailors in the world, you should believe me. Everything I say is true when I talk about catamaran. That's right. Questions and answers. You ask the questions. I give the answers. Questions and answers. That's why we call it questions and answers. I'm Joe Bennett. Like I said, I'm in the top 75% of all catamaran sailors in the world. I've forgotten more about catamaran sailing than you'll ever know. But my real forte is butchering songs on the acoustic guitar in front of some very enthusiastic people in Vasiliki, Spain. I have the first question for the night, evening, day, afternoon, wherever you might be. Why are you not in Vasiliki? I'm coming to you from Lefkada in Vasiliki, Greece, where we've just had a rocking and rolling week of champagne sailing every day of the week, including two round-the-rock races in 25 to 30 guts, knots gusting wind. And also, we had the Ionian Cat Regatta over 25 miles long, where our customers got to experience all kinds of catamarans in all kinds of wind conditions in big seas. Wild wind has it all. Why are you not here? Questions. Speed. Beautiful people. That's the three things that Wild Wind Vasiliki has. We talked about the questions. Let's talk about speed. We have cats. Um, we have miles. What's, what's going on here? Uh, that's, uh, my, that's my chair. Uh, uh, I'm, that's... I'm telling these people about the beautiful people and giving it the beans and cooking chicken and locks in the bagels you know about and beans? breaking the sound barrier. We're boiling the spaghetti in Vasiliki. You don't know anything about beans? Oh. Unfortunately, the real Joe Bennett has showed up and I've got to go. Love you, miss you, bye. Hello, yes, it's Joe here for Joyrider TV. I absolutely don't know what was going on there. Uh, but he certainly sounded slightly American, um, although he did look more like me than I did. So, um, yes, uh, as the other guy said, we're talking about questions and answers. And as the other guy said, yes, it has been an absolutely ridiculous week this week with what's been going on. Uh, so much champ, high quality champagne, not the imported stuff or the cheap sparkling wine, it was definitely the good stuff. Um, anyway, let's just check in with who's here. Hi, Bull Thrush, nice to have you with us. Hello, Nick, again, and we've got oh, Steve OFX1 saying, what have I tuned into? Yeah, perhaps you thought it was the wrong thing. Uh, we've got Charlie, hello, Charlie, nice to have you with us as always. Okay. Yeah, Steve-O says he's not coming to VAS because it is full now until 2022. It is true. Uh, we've only got actually uh, three weeks left in the season and all of them are fully booked now. Uh, that's pretty incredible. It's actually the busiest we've ever been at this time. So well done to everybody who's been coming out on their holidays, but also everybody who hasn't. Well done. Uh, Tim in Florida. Hello from cruising the Bahamas. Ooh, many ideal places to sail, but haven't seen any Hobie cats yet. Sure beats the red tide. I'm sure it does. All right, we've got Nicola. Hello, great to have you with us. Yasupano in Patra. Ignore this. Says Spinnaker? Question marks. Thank you very much. I will. I think I uh, don't know where to go with just the word Spinnaker. Two question marks. Um. Steve-O says he is penciled in 2022. Very good. OK. Um, oh, here's something exciting. We've got Rich from the Class Association on here. He's doing a, a webinar tonight on how to fit out a brand new Hobie 16. So if uh, you haven't got much on, 
Uh, could you just let us know what time that will be, Rich? And I could pass that on. Um, but that sounds really good to me. I would definitely tune into that because even if you have no aspirations of getting a new 16 in the near future, it certainly is a beautiful thing watching a brand new boat being put together. So well worth a look. Arno, Steve-O says the FX1 may be going up for sale soon. That's a shame, but I hope you've got some pretty big plans of what to replace it with. Moth Magic says, I'm going sailing for the first time ever tomorrow. That is great news. Uh, I'm sure that you're going to have an absolutely fantastic time on whatever type of boat it is. Okay, uh, Robert is saying, no, Steve-O, you can't do that. Robert, of course, another uh, FX1 sailor. Yeah. Um, all right. We got Thomas from Germany back. To, he's back. He was here last week. He's now back in Germany. Uh, reports are coming in that it is boring. OK, fair enough. We've got HJ also in Germany in the Blackwood Forest. And Rich from the Class Association says, um, if you want to watch this webinar, from some absolute X, which has got on um, seven o'clock Eastern time on the Hobie class YouTube channel. The uh, so the YouTube channel is called Hobie class. And um, tune in later on for that. It's going to be good. OK, we've got Yap in the Netherlands. Hello. Oh, Steve, O's talking a class. Classic for the replacement. Nice choice. Oh, we've got Kuro 5150. It's been a while. Uh, good to have you back. After a season with more repairs than sailing, we are considering changing our Inter 18 for a Wildcat. Any thoughts? Yeah, the Wildcat is a slippery one. Um, you know, I don't want to say bad things about the Wildcat, but there, the Wildcat has had a problem. I... I think especially the earlier ones with very snappy dagger boards. Um, so if you can look into, if you are looking at getting a wildcat, I would certainly go for one of the later ones, not one of the um, earlier ones, just because of the snappy dagger boards. So example, snappy dagger boards. If you were to sail with your dagger boards down, in double trapezing conditions on a two sail reach, you're very likely to break one. It's a shame. Uh, such a great design, just um, great boat. In fact, we had one here for a bit. So much fun to sail. Very similar feel to the good old design C2, but uh, we got rid of ours after a short, after a few years because we were worried about the dagger boards and all the reports we've been having and some of our guests aren't particularly good at pulling them up at the right time. As we have learned this week, I've got actually a pile. There's a pile of dagger boards being repaired just over here. Even the floral ones, that is a shame from hitting the bottom. OK. All right. And we've got Finn time lapse. Hello, Finn, in Australia. Well, and I thought my day couldn't get any better. And then it did. Ignore this asks, is Hobie the best? Hobie, the Hobie 16 is still the most fun that you can have in more than 20 knots. Yes, it's true. Uh, it's next year I'm needing more practice depowering the 16. Too fast for my skill, but in Vasiliki, Oh, yes. OK. It's this afternoon, by the way. So um, that's good. We're not going to run out of things to talk about. That's for sure. All right. We've got Heitman family. Dave from California. Nice to see you. Uh, I was recently given a 1974 Hobie 16. Joyrider. T Joyrider. TV has pretty much taught me everything I know about sailing. Having a blast. Oh, that's great news. Good to be of service said, um, Dave. And, um, yeah, if you fancy sending us some pictures of that 74, 
the earlier 16s definitely raise an eyebrow and show us your cat. That is for sure. Doesn't matter if it's looking a little bit used because unless you've done a major refurb, it's going to look a bit used being from that sort of vintage. So, yeah, send some pictures and we'll get it on here. Very nice, too. All right. Hello, Bow Wave Paul in the southeast of the UK. All right. Kuro 5150 says seems really like the best we could do on our budget. C2 costs more than twice in the second hand market. Yeah. Um, you could look into the uh, NACRA infusion as well, because uh, the NACRA infusions were very solid F18 um, with some very good results. Uh, from what I've heard, extremely strongly built the NACRAs as well. All right. So we're just going to jump in and have the first preloaded question of the day. And this one comes from Build It Better. Who says, I was out sailing my Hobie 14, flipped it five times. That's a good day out. Uh, it turns out it had a crack in one of the hulls and the hull completely filled with water, needed to be towed into shore, but found large soft spots all across the inner center of the hull when I was uh, working or waiting it, uh, I suppose, working on it. Uh, so I think what Build It Better is asking here is, he says, where exactly should you be standing when you pull your writing line? I assume if my hull wasn't sinking, as I got to pull it up, it would have been easier, but wouldn't mind some tips. Yeah, so um, let's just uh, have a, a small diagram of a boat on its side. There we go. We're looking at the boat like this. Like that. And then if we just make it ever so slightly 3D, there's, or actually the mast would, if we look through the trampoline, the mast would be going there. Sail kind of like that. So there we are. Um, with the Hobie 14 and with the 16, if you're sailing with two people, especially if they're heavy people, the boat is very sensitive when the boat is on its side uh, to movements forwards and backwards. Like if you happen to be slightly heavier sailor uh, with the Hobie 14 and you eat. So you kind of your centre of the hull is kind of in this position here. If you move any further forwards from that position, the boat is going to go bows in pretty dramatically, pretty quickly without going too far towards the bow, especially with 14. So you do need to be very sensitive with where you're standing on the hull. Like there is a strong chance you're going to have to go to the back to let off your main sheet and maybe the traveller um, before you bring the boat back up. Right. So on a 14, you really need to do that quickly, get to the back, let it off, then quickly jump forwards again. Um, if part of your question is, have you damaged your hole by standing in the wrong place? No, you haven't. That softness is going to come from uh, delamination, which was already there. And then perhaps if the boat hadn't been capsized previously, just standing on the hull might have just kind of cracked it a bit as well. But that's not because of bad positioning whilst capsized. That is just because your boat has suffered some delamination. Some delamination can occur if when you finish sailing, if you don't remove the bungs. If you don't remove the bungs and there's any water in the hulls, even if um, it's not particularly hot, you're going to get quite a lot of kind of humidity and uh, pressure build up inside the hulls. And what that humidity can do is start to effectively give the boat osmosis from the inside. I'm kind of making this up, but it sounds good to me. Um, uh, from the inside, which can accelerate this delamination process, which can make your hull soft. So it's very, very, very important that when you finish sailing, you make sure your boat, you take the bungs out of the boat 
you completely empty the boat of any water. And then when you're not using the boat, leave the bungs out. Just, of course, making sure you put them back in before putting the boat back in the water the next time. So this is where you want to be. But like we've said in uh, a lot of videos where we've been writing capsizes, you do need to get forwards on the boat to turn the boat into the wind before you write the capsize so that the bows of the boat are actually pointing directly into the wind. That way the wind gets underneath the sail, helps you to bring it back upright. Um, yeah, so you do need to be sensitive. Same on a 16 if you're sailing with two people, especially if you've got, uh, let's say, about 400 pounds on the boat. Uh, if you are going forwards, um, you just need to be quite sensitive. Otherwise, the boat can pull some pretty interesting shapes. Uh, like on a 16 with two people, if you're going to the back to let off the main sheet and you're quite heavy, send the other person forwards to counterbalance your weight so that you don't um, have some sort of circuses in town moment. But um, yeah, good luck with the repairs to your boat. There's plenty out there about this um, epoxy injection kind of boat repair where you drill a load of holes. In fact, check out the last episode of Show Us Your Cat where Brian did a full job injecting his boat, um, drilling holes in it. Really a very thorough job there, which um, might help you with some... Uh, with some what to do there okay nick says the past weekend i had a nice sail on the reservoir very nice tried to capsize for the first time on the tiger with the jenica up oh managed to didn't try to yet yeah, nice that is that is all part of the game so your last week's video on the topic was put into practice great stuff very nice all right, Finn Time Lapse says, is learning all the racing rules for sailing hard? Um, no, you just um, don't try to do it all at once. I'd say that is. I'm looking for something that's not there, by the way. Sorry. I'm... OK. No. Um... Because before you even start thinking about racing, there are some rules of the road that are important to know. The first one is, or actually let's do this with colours because that really brings things to life, doesn't it? There's the wind as usual. Um, then we're just going to do the first one. So here's a boat. The wind is coming over the right side of the boat first. This boat is on starboard tack. Um, starboard tack is often, um, well, always indicated by the colour green if uh, you're indicating with colours. The opposite, if the wind is coming over the left side of the boat first, uh, indicated by the colour red, is port tack. A boat on starboard tack has right of way over a boat on port tack, which means the boat on port tack has to keep clear. Um, very straightforward. So if we were in a situation, if it had got to this stage where the boats are quite close together, um, it's a bit unnecessary. The boat on port tack should have seen this coming a lot earlier and taken avoiding action beforehand. Like when he was back here, then he could have just turned away from the wind slightly, gone behind the boat on starboard tack and easy. But um, yeah, boat on port stays out of the way of the boat on starboard. Um, the boat on starboard tack, if he has right of, when he's got right of way over a boat on port tack, it's his job just to hold his course. So it's really obvious for the boat on the other tack. Like in racing, if this is one, this is another one. Um, you can't just say, all right, he's going to try to turn behind me. All right, I'm going to turn that way as well. 
to try to um, make him infringe the rule. That is not allowed. You have to hold your course. Also, in racing, when there is a coming together of boats, very important is to let the other boat know that you are there. Sometimes they'll claim they didn't see you. Now, if you're shouting as loudly as you can at the other boat, starboard or something similar, uh, then he can't help but notice you and then he can alter his course. So that is the first rule that you need to know. Um, there are some other rules which we could come on to at another time. Um, I think I might have even done a video on it, to be honest. But yeah, port and starboard, overtaking boat keeps clear and windward boat keeps clear. Those are the three main ones. Then there's some other rules associated with marks. And that is enough that you need to know to start racing. There we go. OK. Nick says uh, this is associated with his capsize with the spinnaker up. One thing we struggled when writing the cat was pointing it into the wind. Yeah, with the tiger, because it is a big, um, voluminous boat, you really need to sink the bow. And if it's not windy, it'll be it'll be extremely slow to come round into the wind. In fact, it might not, there might not even be enough wind to get it to come round into the wind. But if there are two of you, you can get and the wind isn't strong enough to get it to come round, then you can get away with not having it in the perfect direction. Um, one thing that can accelerate turning the boat into the wind is rather than just, it will go back with the picture. Oh dear. Boat on its side. Rather than just standing on the bow, you can actually kind of just hang in the water in this position. And that's going to put a load of drag on the bow of the boat, very much like a sea anchor. And that really is going to help to turn the boat into the wind. So you could try that one next time. OK. All right. We've got Lou, who says hi from the so-called Sailing City. Great to have you on board. All right, we've got Jeff on board in Clear Lake, Washington State, USA. Finally made it to the live chat. Glad you could make it. Thanks for tuning in. Finn Timelapse says, what is a Jenica? A Jenica is another word for an asymmetric spinnaker. Some people aren't happy with me saying that, but that is what a Jenica in this context is usually being called um, an asymmetric. Um, back in the day, spinnakers were like this shape, where they were symmetrical, so you could draw a line down the middle, and it would be the same both sides. Um, but most modern boats, modern designs of boats, uh, have asymmetric spinnakers, which means they're effectively half of that. And it has a tack, a clue, and a head. And you get rid of this bit. And that is what you'd call an asymmetric spinnaker, which a lot of people call a, a genica or a, a, a genaka, if you're from uh, Germany especially. Um, an actual genica is generally, as far as I know, a bit flatter, made more for reaching, might even be on a furling drum rather than what we're using on a lot of the catamarans. I'm probably going to get a lot of abuse for saying that, but I'm sticking to my guns. So there you are. All right, Lou says, Finn. Oh, he's answering. There we go. Uh, Steve-O. Oh, to dry out his boat, he says, he removes the hatches on his FX1. This way, you can't forget to put them back on. Yeah, if you've got a boat with hatches, great idea is to leave the hatches off unless you know it's going to rain. If you've got a boat cover that covers the parts of the boat where the hatches off are, then that's a perfect solution. Leave your hatches off. All right. Uh, bow wave pull. 
Agreeing, top advice, keep the inside of your hull dry when stored. Good prob good quality waterproof and breathable boat cover gets the thumbs up. All right. All right, we've got Nicolo says, greetings from Trieste, Italy. I'd like to ask, how do you handle waves while sailing with moderate, strong wind? Um, all right, to be honest, uh, I don't sail in waves very often these days. Um, it's generally flat water here, or what we get at best is big chop. Um, so big chop being like, fairly short waves up to short and close together up to around what would it be i don't know uh two feet maybe uh like less than one meter high maybe half a meter high like this sort of size so um with those sort of waves what we're doing is if if i'm sailing in this moderate to strong winds and i feel that this chop is slowing me down, then I might just turn, if I'm sailing upwind, then what I'll do is I'll just free off slightly, not that much in fact, I'll free off ever so slightly, like just a few degrees, and that just allows the boat to cut through better. Whereas if you keep trying to point high through these sort of waves, then the boat is going to be kind of seesawing a bit as you go through. Whereas if you put the bow down a bit by bearing off a little bit, um, it really pushes the leeward hull in more, which really drives it through. And that makes the boat a lot more stable. Then. On the beam reach, it's not such an issue because um, you're generally going alongside the waves. So as long as you keep a bit of power on, so you keep that windward hull lifted, then you're OK. Um, it's when you are not keeping the power on and the windward hull is coming down. That's when you can start getting slapped in the face by those waves. And then on the downwind. Um, if I'm. Uh, like yesterday during this epic race that we had, we did have some fairly juicy big chop um, on the downwind with the spinnaker up. And one of the best pieces of advice that I was given was by um, Danny, who is the multiple time tornado world champion. And and this was when we'd been sailing on Lake Garda with some big, decent sized chop. I said, how do you manage the chop? And he said, ignore the chop just go fast so that is what i've been doing uh just ignore the chop straight line go fast it's so when you get actual waves that's when things are different but that's quite a big story so we're going to leave that there um so thanks very much for your question just continuing all right thomas also answering the 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 jenica question it's like yeah, in very basic terms, it is like it's a third sail that you put up when you go downwind. Yeah, I think I entered perhaps at page five of the explanation rather than at page one. Thanks for that, Thomas. All right, we've got Max there over in uh, Rosenheim, Germany, who says, just joining in from my boat park, measuring all the lines that have to be replaced before the big winds come. We'll get a new secondhand Jenica for my Taipan. Wishing you a great tornado world. Thanks very much, man. All right. So Finn says, yeah, I understand the basics like port and stub back on the rules now. But I went to a sailing thing and there was a thing like if both were on starboard and stuff like that. If you're closer to the, I believe he's about to say wind. Wind. Yeah. I hope that makes sense. Yeah. This is, um, this is the next one we were talking about, um, was the windward boat keeps clear. So if we've got one boat, wind coming over left side first, so this boat is on port tack. And then if we've got another boat coming this way, this is a, 
reasonably extreme example, but it's viable. The, the boat that is nearer to where the wind is coming from, wind's coming from here, is called the windward boat in very much the same way that the side of the boat closer to where the wind is coming from is called the windward side. So this would be the windward side of the boat. This is the windward boat and the windward boat keeps clear. And there we are. Windward boat keeps clear, which means in this situation, the windward boat would have to turn. He could, he could maybe jibe if he'd have seen it a bit earlier or he has to turn to go either in the same direction as this boat or further up. But again, in this situation, he should have seen it earlier. Another windward boat keeps clear example would be if there's two boats on the same tack. A bit less extreme. Now, this boat is the windward boat and he would have to keep clear of this boat. Um, yeah, it's a, it can be used as a tactical device. But um, yeah, basically, if you are the windward boat, you have to keep clear. There we go. All right, we're still on the rules because we've got Kurosh on board in Dubai. Great to have you with us, Kurosh. I don't know if you've been to Canada yet and you've had some sailing there. Or if, um, but uh, I hope it's all been going well. All right, he's talking about um, going around a buoy. So the main uh, rule for going around a buoy happens at any free leg of the course. That is any mark that is not the windward mark. So in the course, we'd have maybe a leeward mark and a windward mark. Again, this word windward meaning closer to where the wind is coming from. So that's the windward mark. Don't worry about that one, because at that mark, it's just port and starboard. It, we're talking in fairly basic terms, port and starboard and windward boat keeps clear. Then at the free mark of the course, this could be the same if we had a mark over here. But these days, in most races, it would be some sort of windward leeward kind of arrangement what we're looking for i haven't read my rules book recently so maybe i should but um as it was before if what we have at the mark is an imaginary it's been going between two and three boat lengths so let's say we've got an imaginary three boat length circle here um at the leeward mark of the course if there are two boats coming in, so you'd be coming in at this sort of angle. Okay, we're all good so far. Yes, we are. All right, so we're coming into this free boat length circle on the downwind leg, looking to go around the mark and then back up wind. If when the first boat enters the free boat length circle. There is a boat that has an overlap, meaning the front of his boat is in front of the back of this boat. That means that this boat, let's call this boat A, has the right of way to take this inside line around the boy. So boat B just has to give him enough time to make a rounding. So what boat A can't do is go, all right, I'm going to push you off the buoy and keep sailing down here. No, boat A just sails around the buoy. Boat B has to give him space to do that in that situation. All right. So if going into this free boat length circle, If boat A does not have an overlap, so from this line off the back of boat B, like this, if boat A is clear astern, which means he doesn't have an overlap, then he's not going to have any right of way 
at the boy. So especially if he's coming down fast, he's going to need to very quickly think of an alternative strategy for getting round the boy. The same thing goes if there's a, a boat coming in on the other tack. then this boat is clearly inside this dotted line extending off the back of this boat, meaning he is well inside the overlap, meaning that he definitely gets room to jibe, go around the boy and then back up. So that is in a nutshell, the, um, the rules for rounding a free mark of the course. All right, I'll leave that there for a minute. Let's get back to where we were. All right, Nick says, all right, we're back to Nick with um, writing the capsized tiger. We were standing all the way out at the bow. But it kept turning downwind. We pulled the Jenica into the chute. Sheets and Traveller were released. Wind was probably 13 to 14 knots. OK, yeah, so that would. Yeah. So sometimes if you've capsized in an unusual way, sometimes you need to do other things uh, slightly out of the ordinary to get the boat to do what you want. So um, just thinking, um, I can't actually think what way the wind would be blowing. But sometimes if by going to the front of the boat, if the boat starts going the wrong way and not turning into the wind, you can try. This is going to be a shocker going to the back of the boat, get your weight on the back of the boat, anchor that part down. And then sometimes the boat will then spin in the right direction for you, because usually when you've capsized, um, it will be kind of like. The mast will be pointing downwind from the trampoline, stand at the front and it's going to pivot round. Or if the mast is pointing into the wind, stand at the bow, mast's going to pivot round the other way. But if perhaps the boat is pointing pretty much downwind, then standing on the stern might be more appropriate to get the boat to turn into the wind. So if standing on the bow is making the boat turn the wrong way, then try standing at the stern or just standing in the centre of the boat near the dolphin striker and see if the boat turns from there. If you've got about 14 knots of breeze, something's going to happen. So just give the boat a little bit of time. OK, we've got Guilimo, I'm going to say. Uh, hi, great to have you on board. All right. Rich says, can't say enough about keeping the bungs out when out of the water. Yes, osmosis and mould is a real problem. Thank you very much, Rich, for confirming that. That's what I thought. All right. We've got uh, O who says P Nuss. I don't know what that means. Um, Finn says, is Whirlwind your company? No. Um, uh, Whirlwind is actually Whirlwind Sales in California, USA, who makes some very good aftermarket Hobie sales. Now, I'm working at Wildwind, um, which is a holiday company. It's not my company. I've just been working here for a very long time. All right. So, Finn Time Lapse is definitely getting his money's worth today. Um, let's see. Where are we? Oh, message has been retracted. OK. OK, and he says, and will we ever get a vid with Mrs. Joyrider TV? We've already had videos with Mrs. Joyrider TV. They were called Stretching for Sailors. She's a yoga teacher. So we did some very good um, yoga. No, uh, it was yoga based stretching for people who really um, Probably thin time lapse, too young to actually need to stretch. But as you get a bit older, it does become um, not only necessary, but very helpful. 
All right. We are actually coming up to 40 minutes and I've got a lot of preloaded questions. So if we could just hold fire on the questions coming in, uh, that would be great. I'm, just gonna, uh, I'm gonna go on to the next preloaded question now, which is from, uh -huh, it's from Alan S and from Jonah the Scientist. This was in the comments on uh, one of the tornado videos, I think. Um, yeah, it was on one of the tornado videos. So, um, they're asking, how am I mounting the floating stick to the back of the boat? Okay, it's, it's more straightforward than you'd think. Basically, we've got the boom like here. And then onto the boom, I'm attaching a stick that extends, what, about a metre behind the boat. And then onto the end of the stick, I'm using a GoPro Max, which was very kindly donated by Trey, um, who was out here on holiday a little while ago. And then the, um, the artificial intelligence magic of the GoPro Max then actually, because it's made of two, camera, two cameras, which do 180 degrees each, um, and it actually takes the stick out of the picture making it look like you're just being chased by a very well piloted drone very good indeed and um i hope that everybody's not getting sick of this 360 footage but i really like it so unless people start saying can we go back to some non 360 footage then um i'm going to i'm going to keep doing it there we go all right all right, we've got Jasmine eight. Hello, great tips. Thanks, Joe. Greetings from where would that be? I should know. Oh, I've let myself down there. Comes as I who will say. All right, HJ says, Oh, yes, had a snapped main halyard just when I went out in the trapeze. Oh, my goodness. All right. Ian White. Hello, Ian uh, says, what's the cheapest way to get into the sport? I say the best one of the best ways of getting into the sport is to go. If you've got a local sailing club, go to your local sailing club and talk to the members down there. See if they've got any sort of scheme for getting people into the sport. Um, I started sailing through my school um, where there was one of the teachers who was teaching. Uh, the students how to sail in the evenings after school and through the sailing club I then started sailing with some of the guys who were racing who were looking for reliable crew so that's the word reliable if if people are looking for crew at a sailing club they want to know that the person who's offering it up as the crew is dedicated to getting stuck in so for me it was every Wednesday evening then every Sunday um, and uh, that's what people want, reliability, because um, you start doing some training before and after the races and putting a lot of effort into becoming a good team. That's a great way of getting into the sport. I'd say that is possibly the cheapest way. All it will cost is the membership to that sailing club uh, to do it. Um, another way of getting into the sport would be to go somewhere where they're doing sailing lessons and maybe that is a good way another way of getting into the sport is just getting a cheap boat anything will do you can pick stuff up for not very much um there's hobie 16s going for like less than 500 dollars if you're in the us well worth the sniff yeah but i'd go with the club option because you learn a lot from that you meet other like-minded individuals or let us know where you are and maybe there'll be somebody who'd be keen to take you out for a burn all right so next preloaded question comes from robert all right this is a good one uh he says 
why do you keep the traveller on the centre line when going downwind with the spinnaker up? Wouldn't you get more power easing it? Um, if you're sailing without a spinnaker, then yes, absolutely, you would want to be letting your traveller out probably to just halfway between the toe strap and the outside of the beam for downwind sailing. But with the spinnaker up, here we go. Here is the boat. With, I don't know why we're even drawing this. Um, oh yeah, I do. Um, with, with the boat with the spinnaker up, what's happening is the spinnaker is making such a dramatic effect to our apparent wind. That's the wind that we're sailing on as we go along. So as we know, or perhaps we don't, the apparent wind is made from, we've got the true wind, which would be coming from here. Then we've got the induced wind. That is the wind that we create by moving forwards coming from in front of the boat. And then the wind that we are actually using is a combination of the two, which would be something like this, maybe even a bit more like this. If we're going really fast for the strength of the wind, this is going to be bigger. This is going to be less significant. So our induced wind is going to be coming back more, which means when we feed this wind through this monstrous wind acceleration device, which is the spinnaker, the wind's going to come off here. And it's going to follow the line of the spinnaker like this. And then so then when we actually get to the mainsail. If it's not totally on the center line. so. The center line is where it wants to be because there the wind is just going to hit it and it's going to be perfect. If we let the mainsail out at all, like we might do traditionally, then we're using some colors here, then the wind is going to hit it and we're going to get a turbulent airflow there, nothing here, and we're going to get a load of drag. It's going to slow the boat down. So that is why we're cranking the main in if we're sailing in stronger wind with the spinnaker up. Um, yeah, so there we go. In lighter wind, we uh, because the boat isn't going to be going quite as fast, we're not going to be cranking the main in as hard. But I would still keep the traveller in the middle on the Tornado or the F-18, even in the light winds, and just have less tension in the main sheet and then as we increase the speed bringing the main sheet in more so there you go that is the why all right all right i'm not going to be reading out all of the comments now just because there's too many i don't have much time okay jeff m nakra says our wind season is starting soon in Hong Kong, which is where Jasmine 8 is as well. I knew I'd seen that flag somewhere before, of course. Can't wait for those Easter winds. Nice. Okay, Russell says, love the 360 footage and the horizon uh, levelling looks awesome off the back of the boom. Thanks very much. Yeah, I am really into it, as you could probably tell. All right. All right. And um, Finn says, OK. He's heading off now because it's 2.15 in the morning. All right. All right. Thanks for tuning in. All right. Oh, we've got Chris with a trampoline question. Uh, these are often my favourite questions. But before that, we're just going to take, for everybody watching this later, a short commercial break. All right, and we're back. Um, Chris says, what's your opinion on mesh trampolines versus vinyl? Um, 
I'm, you may have spotted it, but I'm always using mesh trampolines. And I think one of the big plus points for the mesh trampoline is the fact that the water just drains straight through. Perhaps if you are sailing um, in colder water and you don't want, you know, if you're sitting on the boat for a long period of time, stronger winds, then as well as the water going down through the trampoline, it will come up through the trampoline as well. So perhaps the vinyl means you're going to get less spray coming up through the trampoline. But for me, it's mesh all the way. Now, one thing that people do find with the mesh trampoline is they are more abrasive on the knees. So the vinyl is going to be a bit kinder to you on the knees. Um, so those are my main points that I consider when thinking mesh versus vinyl. Um, I don't know how they line up in durability, how long they last. Would be very interesting to get a vinyl tramp out here. If anybody would like to send me out, uh, any of the manufacturers would like to send me a vinyl trampoline for testing, be very interested. We'll put it on a boat next year, side by side with a new mesh trampoline, see which one lasts better. But that is all I've got for you on that at this time. All right, we've got AJ who's given us a picture of a goat. Thank you. Uh, William, good morning. Oh, yeah, that's a good point from Kurosh there. Um, when talking about uh, the spinnaker with the traveller in the centre and the main sheet, when it's double trapezing conditions, it is important to pull the main sheet in tight because what that is doing is giving the mast support. Um, so if you don't quite get what we're talking about is if here's the boat, we've got massive bows, a bit like an inter 20. Um, there is the mainsail and there is the spinnaker. So, but the spinnaker, the, the rigging on the boat is coming from here. So the mast is supported very nicely up to this point here. But above that point, the mast doesn't have any fixed support network, which it needs. So the spinnaker is pulling the top of the mast constantly, which means if it is windy, we need to support the mast because otherwise what happens with metal things is if they keep flexing over and over again like that, eventually it's just going to snap. We had that a lot with our spinnaker poles back in the early days. Um, so we need to support the top of the mast. And the way we do that is by cranking in the main sheet hard, because what that's doing is it's pulling down here, which is pulling down here, which is pulling the top of the mast back, which is giving us that support that we need. Good point there, Kurosh, thank you. Yes, absolutely true. All right, next preloaded question coming in. All right, this one's a little bit juicier. This is from Willis, who says, I can't find anything on modification of my old Hobie. He says spreader, but I think that is perhaps not what he means. Um, I had a broken tiller end cap and it cost about the same to get the old adjust, the old school adjustable end cap. Any recommendations on how to install it? I want to make sure. No, I'm just re reading now. Um, all right. I think Willis. Sorry if you've been waiting all week for this answer, but if you could send me some pictures of exactly what you mean I will definitely be able to give you a good answer but without the pictures I'm not really visualizing what you're talking about sorry about that all right moving on we've got Steve who says might think about fitting a foot strap for the back foot really helps to keep your footing oh yes it does and you can still get out if you pitch pole all right yeah um the foot strap is 
pretty common, extremely commonplace in the bigger. Oh yeah, um, yeah, Willis. Sorry about that. Um, email is the best. Total Joyrider at iCloud.com. Total Joyrider. Just type in at iCloud.com. There we go. Um, yeah. So um, the foot strap is very common on the the bigger boats because, especially if they've got a spinnaker. So we'll have a foot strap here. Um, and it means that the crew, when flying the spinnaker, when it's windy, can be very secure at the back of the boat. Gives them a big feeling of security. Very nice indeed. But what I'm sensing here when we're talking about the foot strap is should you put one on your or one on each side? of your Hobie 16 or 14. And my answer would be, unfortunately, no. The reason I would say no on the 16 is the low volume of the holes on the 16. Um, it means on the leeward side, it's quite likely to be catching in the water. That is the first reason why not. But the second reason why not, which perhaps is the better reason, is if we take a close up of the back of the boat. And our rudder system, so we've got that D part of the rudder system. And then we've got the tiller arm like that. And there's the rudder blade. Lovely. That's pretty good, actually. I just drew that. Um, now, the problem here is going to be if we put a foot strap, the best place to put it would be right at the back, of course. Um, here, what's going to happen is every time you steer, the foot strap is going to catch on the tiller arm. And that is going to be pretty unsatisfactory, if you ask me. So that is the, re the other reason why I wouldn't go putting foot straps on the back of the 16 or 14. There we go. All right, next preloader from Nicola, who I believe is here live as well. Um, tying the battens looks straightforward enough. However, I can't figure out how to untie them after the sailing session. Do you leave them tied for the whole season? and then cut off the ropes, or is there a way to untie them rapidly after each session? Yeah, it really depends on what sort of knot you've used to tie them in. Now, should you untie your battens after every session? Now, if you wanted your sail and your battens to last longer, and you've got time on your hands, and you're the sort of person who is quite um, keen to do as much with your boat as possible and you know that you're going to have time the next time you go to go out sailing then the answer is yes that it really will help prolong the life of your battens and your mainsail to untie the battens first but if you've got them tied in using a knot which is really pretty difficult to untie um it is, of course, going to be very uh, difficult to untie them. So you need to use a good knot. I don't even know if I can draw. I don't know if I'm going to try. I think I'm going to fail. If I try, I will fail. So I'm not going to try on this occasion. But it's better to try and fail, isn't it, than fail without even trying. All right, here we go. So here is the clue of the, the end of the baton pocket. We're in super large scale here. Here is the hole in the end of the batten pocket and the batten is here with a hole in the end. All right, so on the other side of the sail, we've got a, a hole like this as well. Let's draw this here. And we're gonna put that in there. In fact, hold on, we could do better than this. Give us a second.
All right. All right, although this is a baton, we are going to assume this is the hole like this on the other side of the sail. And we're just going to attach. If you use a fairly nice, this rope is really cheap. This is, um, what is this? One and a half millimeter, maybe two mil, um, just rope with a polyester core. It probably costs not very much at all. and. Um, yeah, I would use this sort of rope for the batten ties. And then if we can uh, pretend that this is actually the end of the sail, we're going to put this in double and then pass the rest of it through, which is what a lark's foot. Pulling it. Oh, dear. It's. But anyway, you, I think you get the idea. So it's going to look kind of like that, but the rope is broken, so I can't actually do it. Sorry, I was rushing. Um, OK, so that is how um, the rope would be attached on the other side with an even amount of tail from both. I would probably go so that when you've got that tied in, you've got about that much rope, which is what's that 20 centimeters coming through and then what you'll do is you'll pass both ends through here so both ends will come up out of the batten and then what we're going to do is they're both going to go down through the hole and then they're going to come up on top where we are going to tie a reef knot on the top. Now, a reef knot is this one, which is uh, right over left and then left over right. How are we drawing this? God, this isn't as easy as uh, so I thought it wasn't going to be. All right, that's not how it's going to look. But anyway, and then so we'll pull that tight, tuck the ends in. And then that's done. That re <laughs> looks terrible. Um, that reef knot is definitely the most easy to untie. So that is certainly um, the right knot to use. If um, you do find afterwards that it's difficult to use, then you could use a tool such as a marlin spike. Or what you're more likely to have is a small screwdriver just to get inside the knot and untie it. But um, there you go. Yes, loosen your battens off. Um, but if you've not got much time, I dare say 99% of people sailing catamarans don't loosen off their battens, apart from if you're sailing a boat with mylar sails, the top two or three pardon, will get loosened or untied every time. But other than that, I would dare say all of the battens get left in and tied unless people see that there's creases in the batten pocket. There we go. So I hope that was a good answer for you there, Nicola. Um, and yeah, there we go. So um, we've been going over an hour now. So if we could just hold back from any more live questions, that would be great. We've got Rick who says, what are your thoughts on adding wings to a Hobie 16? Yeah, um, yeah, I'm not I'm not a fan of adding the wings to a Hobie 16, to be honest, unless it's because you've got some sort of um if you if you can't trapeze, uh, perhaps for a a reason with um, your body doesn't want to trapeze for some reason, then adding wings could be a very good option. So hold on, if we just draw, this is, the drawings get a bit more simple as we get towards the end as well. Uh, so this is looking onto the back of the 16. Um, if you were gonna put wings on a 16, I would put on what is generally called a trap seat rather than like a magnum wing, which you might put on an 18. So 
the magnum wing would be like this, where perhaps we've got a bit of reinforcement here. Now, if you put wings like that on a 16, the amount of windage, firstly, is going to be horrendous for the size of the boat. Uh, the weight is going to be significant. And uh, whether the weight is in a good place as well really raises the eyebrow. Whereas if you just um, are not going to trapeze and you want wings to replace the trapezing aspect, then the trap seat is more of one that just comes like this. And perhaps it would even be on a cantilever, cantilever, maybe that's the word I can use, where you'd have this one out and there'd be a line going up the mast down to the other one. And while you're not using the other one, it sits kind of vertical. So what you do when you tack is you go across the boat, push this one down and that lifts this one up so it doesn't drag in the water when you're on the other side. That would be the best option for wings on a 16. But if you're going to be double trapezing, then I would not put wings on a 16 because what you're going to be doing, as well as adding weight and windage, is you're going to be overloading the hulls as well. And the whole thing, you're going to snap your rudder blades, too much load, and it's going to be not as good. So there we go. All right, I've got Willis on board who's got a bit more of an explanation with this. He says the older cupped tiller end style with one screw and a lock nut in the channel. Yes, I've got you now. OK, now I understand. Not the new school screw unschool. It might need its own video. Wondering if I need to trim the old side rivet holes off where. No. Um... <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. So firstly, do you need. Unfortunately, I haven't got one of the old style tiller connecting bars. I have got though. All right, I am coming back. Uh, just give us a second. This is the good thing about being in the workshop is there are things that we can use which definitely paint a picture of what we're up to here. All right, so. This is what might be called the new style system for a Hobie 16 uh, connecting bar or other boats like the Tiger uses these as well, the FX1. Uh, so this is on the end of the tiller arm. It's very easy, very quick to take on and off. You just have a clip that goes onto the top. Um, so with your old um, tiller connecting bar, you're going to have quite a big hole in the bottom where that screw goes through, but that's not an issue. Um, what? All you need to do is take the old one out. As long as this is flat, then you can put the insert in, just make a screw hole, both sides, just the right size for the small screw, which hopefully would come with it. And then that should actually thread itself into the aluminium. And that is done. Easy. Um, there's not much to it, really. Uh, the one thing that you might need to look at is... Um, the length of the conrod, whether this is actually going to take away some of the length that you had previously. And then I would say when you've got this fitted, if you do have an option with the length. You want to have about that much of the thread exposed because that gives you enough wiggle room to go in and out uh, if you need to adjust your rudder alignment. Um, yeah, so yeah, I would say you don't need to trim the old side rivet holes. Um, you could just, if this plastic insert isn't already drilled, the concern is to make sure I have room to adjust it in and out. Yeah, exactly. 
But um, these screws don't actually go all the way through the insert that goes in here. So that shouldn't be an issue. And there shouldn't be anything else in here to prevent that. Just It just depends on the length of your tiller connecting bar. I think that is what we're talking about. Okay. Um, yeah, I've, as far as I can feel, that is pretty much the answer that we need here, unless you've got a bit more question to add on to that. But if that is all, then very good. I'm pleased. All right, Willis says, my new tramp is on its way and should be launching by now, by November, sorry. If you can find any old ones lying around, make a video. I can't find anyone who's done one. Okay, yeah, will do. Uh, <laughs> A Conrod conversion video. I think that would be very useful for everybody. Um, so there we go. That is all we've got time for this afternoon or this morning or whatever time of day it is. Thanks very much to everybody who's been uh, getting stuck in live. Don't forget to go and check out um, this webinar that Rich is doing from the Hobie class association i'm just getting the details again just scrolling back um yeah he's doing a, a webinar tonight on fitting out a brand new hobie 16 juicy and that will be seven o'clock eastern time usa on the hobie class youtube channel so make sure you subscribe to the hobie class youtube ch channel there's some really good stuff on there well worth a look. They get a lot of the industry professionals, people from the factory, people from the class association, racers, people like that. Uh, so get stuck in there. Otherwise, see you next week with some more of this. And that'll be the last Q&A before I head off to go to um, the World Championships um, next weekend. Very exciting times. Uh, we've got coming tomorrow on Joyrider TV, the next instalment in the Round the Rock series this week. Oh my goodness, you're going to like that. There was so much wind. Um, it was a dirty race uh, <laughs> for some reason. I don't know why it was dirty. But um, yeah, check that one out. That'll be at the same, the usual time tomorrow. And then on Sunday, we're going to be having the, um, at the same time, uh, the video evidence from the Ionian regatta, uh, which I sailed on the tornado, which was an absolute flipping cooking session. So um, check that one out on Sunday. Thanks very much. Once again, see you soon with some more on Joyrider TV. Thank you. <laughs>